Hello everyone, and welcome to Let's Play Europa Universalis 3. And I will be playing the glorious nation of Bavaria. Yay! So, for those of you who've never seen this game, played this game, or even heard of this game, this is another grand strategy game by Paradox. It is very much like Hearts of Iron, except for the fact that it is not Hearts of Iron. And it is very much like Victoria, except for the fact that it is not Victoria. And there are many other huge differences between it and many other Paradox games. Namely, the fact that you can go from 1399 all the way up to 1820. Yeah, that's about 400 years of time that you can actually take over. So basically, it goes from the early Renaissance all the way up to the end of the French Revolution and the Napoleonic era, and that's about it. So it basically goes from... So, um... I guess from where uh, Crusader Kings left off to basically where Victoria starts. So, yeah. So that's it. And, uh, as we look at the map here, it is a very strange Europe. For example, Germany is a bunch of little states. Like, most of them are only one state provinces, and one province states. And, uh, most of them are very weak as well, like, uh, like, Frankfurt has only, like, one territory, and they're incredibly small compared to everything else. Bavaria is one of the nicer ones to play as, because you because, um, you're surrounded by a bunch of different great powers, so if you get more powerful, you can actually, uh, get an alliance with them more likely later on, so, um, it's much easier to play as than a lot of the others I've found. I've, I've tried playing as them, but, frankly, you just get overwhelmed after a while, and... I guess, I guess as Bavaria, you have a better chance of getting a more equal challenge, and playing as the Teutonic Order is kind of unfair, because it's like, you, you start out with so much power, it's just ridiculous, and you can practically take over anyone at the very beginning, like, you can go over and take Pomerania if you want to, Beskov, Riga, you can even go to war with Poland and Lithuania if you're really strong later on, and it, it's just not that much fun, it's like just breezing through the game. So, Bavaria gives you a nice challenge. It do, it's not too hard, but it's not too it's not too easy either, like playing, of course, England or France. France is extremely easy. In fact, they even have a huge they even consider France to be a blob country and that and that they'll be able to take over the world very quickly because they have so much so much landmass and their and their king is just ungodly powerful at the start because he has uh, perfect stats and everything. Yeah, so basically the way leaders work in this game is that they have three different skills, di administrative, diplomatic, and military, and the max is eight, the l lowest is three, and basically France's king and England's king start out with... Well, that's weird. Ugh, that's odd. He has five stars, but not four... F he has four, four, and three. How strange. Well, either way, France starts out with eight, eight, and eight. That makes them very strong. Castile, which is basically Spain, has a lot of power as well, and Bavaria is pretty weak. Not a very strong king, but it doesn't really matter all that much, really, who your leader is. It's more about how well you can play the game and what the difficulty setting is. So, um, basically in this game, the best thing that you can possibly do is try to not piss off everybody and try to take as much stuff as you can. Missions are key in this game. You get missions every single week, basically, if you complete them. So that the next week you'll get an, a new mission, and it usually can really help you by giving you a new conquest, cause a spy in a, a neighboring country, or get, or assign you to take over another country by vassalation, vassalization, or something like that. So this is a very objective-based game, if uh, if you want to play it that way. That is. The only problem, however, is when it, when you really get into the game is that the Holy Roman Empire controls pretty much all of central Germany 
and uh, so northern Italy and eastern Europe because they're all under the dominion of the Holy Roman Emperor. So basically they try to make it so that countries can't just take each other over without incurring a penalty. So let's just get into the options here. So these are just the basic options for the game whenever you set up a, a game and this kind of explains how everything goes. I'll just explain each one. This, these are like the most important factors in any game. Advisors or who you hire to help your country and improve it in particular ways. And sitting on normal makes it so that you just get a, a random pool, basically, and you can get various different guys. Event means that you get your advisors only through events, which can be very, very um, annoying. And historic it can also be very annoying because sometimes it doesn't give you any advisors at all, which is totally stupid. Every every single nation on Earth has always had some sort of cabinet and of some sort, you know. I mean, no nation has ever lasted without some sort of some sort of cabinet of some sort. But anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, so and leaders leaders are basically who leads your country and who are your generals and conquistadors and admirals and explorers. So setting on normal is the best way. Event just the same as advisors. Leaders, if you put it on historical, you will not get any leaders if you're playing as Bavaria. I'm just saying. So go on to colonists. Free means you don't have to pay for them. Normal just means you have to pay for them. It's a more fair challenge for everybody if you pay for them. So colonists can help you do. You, you need colonists in order to colonize territory that's either taken over by something like the Golden Horde or or just new territory like in the Americas, South America, Africa, places like that that haven't been colonized yet. So merchants, they can help you to gain income by trading with other territories or even in your own territories if you set up your own center of trade which is where trade basically happens so if you have one you're you're pretty much set to go to make a shitload of money especially if you're Venice Venice starts out with a center of trade and they have probably the m most valuable one other than uh, other than the Hansa that has the Lubeck which is also very valuable so here we have missionaries they're also very important and all these are just either free or normal so I'm just gonna leave one on normal Missionaries are very helpful. They can help you to spread your religion and also to um, basically make it so that you not only control the territory, but it also is your state religion. So if you're feeling uh, inquisitor-like, then uh, go ahead and put missionaries every everywhere. You also need them to uh, help your influence with the Pope, and uh, that's it. I don't know why I'm scrolling around like this. I just normally do that when I'm bored. Um, inflation... Inflation is in this game. Yes, it is. Even though most of everything that they ever used in the past was actual gold and silver, inflation can still happen because you were printing more money, you can get money from copper and other stuff, so yeah, inflation can be, you know, I like having inflation off usually when I play with other guys, but Having inflation on can give you a huge challenge because that means you can't just put everything into your treasury and make, make money every single turn without getting, you know, obviously a penalty for doing that and inflating the gold market. Because when you have more money, it's going to be less valuable because of supply and demand. So, we're going to leave that on just to make sure that every other country follows that as well. That way no country gets ridiculously powerful by just funding their treasury and not even a single technology and overwhelming everybody with a shitload of mercenary armies. So, we want the size of the colonists to be normal because that'll be 200. Basically, how the size of the colonists means how, s how large your colonial groups are going to be. So, when you send off a colonist group, it's going to be either 200, 300, 400, 400 I think. Uh, 100. I think they have setting for 100. No, I guess not. But anyway, 200 is the normal one. I don't know why they have a second thing for 200. It might actually be 100, but I'm not so sure. Uh, difficulty? That basically means how efficiently you play. That only affects human players. Because I think it, sh I think it changes everything for AI players so that they, they all play with the same factors. So Putting it on normal basically means that you have a normal challenge with everybody else. You're basically on, a, on the same playing field as every everyone else in the game, including AI and human players. 
AI aggressiveness, this is usually good to have on normal too, because if they're too aggressive, they'll try to take you over, or other places over, like I've seen England take over all of France sometimes, or Castile taking over all of North Africa, things like that, Denmark taking over all of North Northern Europe, so it's not it's not pretty if you don't have that on normal or something reasonable. Spread of land provinces and sea provinces. I'm not so sure about this one. I think this is one you explore, but anyway. Sea provinces, I'm not so sure about that one. I'm just going to skip it. Land provinces. I think that's how fast cores develop. And the way and the way this game basically works when you take over something is that, see, when you go over a country, you can hot, you can if you move your mouse over, it'll change the name. So, like, there I have uh, Munchen, there's Schwaben, Oberfoss and Niederbayern. So those are four different provinces, and, I, and if I have cores on them, that means I basically control the infrastructure and the cultural developments and pretty much every every uh, rightful part of that province. So it's like I'm not just occupying it with my people and my military force. Like, there's actually Germans living there, you know, it's not just a bunch of mercenaries just occupying the province. So. Those are important to have on 50 because if you have it on 25, then the country just, just takes everything over. It can just, you know, get super powerful and then eventually just overrun everything. So it's good to just have it on normal so that there's an equal playing field for everybody. And spies. Spies are semi-useful. They can sometimes be helpful if you're trying to, like, decrease the stability of another country that you're going to go to war with. Usually they're better to use during peacetime because during wartime, I think you're a I think the AI gets a bonus during wartime to, like, uh, be more defensive against spy espionage, so... Spies aren't that useful in this game, actually. They're more useful in Hearts of Iron 2 and 3, but... Especially 2, but, um... Yeah, spies spies are pretty useless, honestly. Lucky nations, I think that means that, like, nations will get better bonuses, better leaders, stuff like that, so I'm just going to set it on none. Because, you know, frankly, if I set it on historical, England, France, and probably Russia are going to get the best leaders, so I'm going to leave it on none, because that's just that's just fair. Alright, so I'm done explaining the game. I guess I'll just go through the geography of the game before I go in, because when we play the, when you play the game, you don't see everything. Like, even though you may see everything at the loading screen, you don't see it in-game. You see exactly what your country knows about, whether or not France has discovered Japan or not. Unless you've seen it, you don't see it. So it's very realistic. Like... Uh, like the people, like the people of uh, of all of Europe, they they have no idea anything's over there, so it doesn't even appear on the map. So this game can be pretty fun, especially when you get really powerful and start sending explorers everywhere, because then you can start colonizing, getting a lot of provinces that are your own. No one else can control them but you, unless they take it over from you. And uh, so over here. It's actually kind of boring to play as the, as the Native American tribes because there's not very many of them, and they don't really have that many power struggles, so they're just sort of sitting there basically waiting for the Europeans to come in and attack them. That's pretty much all that really happens whenever you play as one of them. I've never really played as one of them before, but I have seen other people play as them, so it's pretty boring just, you know, just sort of waiting for stuff to happen. I have seen the uh, Shawnee and Crete take over all of uh, the South and... and uh, Midwest, and the Iroquois are here on have sometimes taken each over. over. Aztec, the Aztecs almost always take over Zapotec and Maya. That almost always happens. Inca almost always dominates this area over here because only Chimu, which is incredibly small. <laughs> they only have one province, too, so they almost always get destroyed by the Inca. That's all there really is to it. There's a lot of, there's a lot of African tribes in um, Africa. Like, uh, on the on, in Western Africa, there's a bunch of different tribes, like the Songhai and the Mali and the Oyo, Hausa, stuff like that, the Congo. Uh, there's also the Swahili on the east side, the Ethiopians. And then on the north, you actually have the Berbers and the Algerians and the Tripolians, the Mamluks, which are basically the uh, Egyptians and... And, uh... And, uh... 
the people who control the Western Middle East. I don't know, it's kind of hard to describe them, I guess. Those are the Moroccoans. The, the Spanish almost always go to war with the Moroccoans for some reason, so I guess this is because they're really close to them. They're basically the Berbers, so yeah, that's all there is to Africa, basically. Obviously, later on, you can colonize Africa if you're in a European country, and if you're one of the African countries, you're going to have a really tough time trying to defend because you... The, uh, the technology is adva advanced based on your, um, based on your nationality, basically. So, like, Native American tribes and African tribes will discover technology slower because they, they're not as involved in the overall technology and so forth, and you don't have as many people. It's kind of complicated, so, anyway, um... Yeah, Scotland and England are still separate from each other. Spain still isn't unified. Um, France isn't unified. They have like a million different vassals, like Orléans and Berry and Alençon. Poland is incredibly small. Bohemia is the Holy Roman Emperor. Lithuania is pretty big. The Golden Horde is still around. They're basically the remnants of the Western Mongol Empire. There's obviously the Mongol Kanate there. The Ming still control China. The Japanese are still not unified, and India is still not unified, and the Timurids are still flourishing around Iran and the eastern Middle East, so that's about there, all there really is to it. Constantinople is still held by the Byzantine Empire, by the way, so that usually gets taken over by the Ottomans, who are very strong at this point in time. And, uh... Yeah, so my main rivals would probably be the Palatinate, which is this uh, Cyan country over here that I'm highlighting here. Ansbach, Wurttemberg, Austria, and especially Bohemia. They are very powerful since they're the Holy Roman Emperor. Basically, if you become the Holy Roman Emperor, you get a shit load of bonuses. I mean, you become so freaking powerful, you can literally take on anybody. And you don't need to cause this belay. No one will attack you other than the guys in the alliance. So, <laughs> if you if you try taking over Ulm, for example, as Bavaria, and the Holy Roman Emperor, Emperor decides on protecting them, he's going to attack you, and you will lose unless you control half the world. So, good luck if you're trying to go to war with somebody without um, having the Holy Roman Emperor on your side. So that's about it to the geography, and uh, with that, let's start the game. Did you know inflation is bad? Yes, I did know that. You don't have to remind me, game. <laughs> okay, and I'm gonna turn off the music, actually, because it is super loud, and I, I frankly don't like it in this game. Okay, so here we go. There's a an ungodly amount of map modes, by the way, to choose from in this game. I have no idea why they made so many, but it is actually very helpful. Like You can see the terrain, which is in every game, basically. The political, which is in every game. And you have the re religion map mode, imperial map mode, which shows who's a member of the Holy Roman Emperor Empire. Trade map mode, which basically shows who's loyal to each center of trade. Diplomatic map mode, religion map mode, such and such and such. Oh, whatever. Let's just get on with the game. Okay, Political map mode is my favorite. It just shows who owns what. That's that's simple enough. So let's get on with the game. Okay, first mission. God's will has been made clear to you. Hmm, I've never seen that before. The Franconian inheritance. Oh, I love this one. The House of Wittelsbach has has was granted various Franconian lands by the Emperor Henry V. It is time that Bavaria took them. Okay, so. Here we have our little country of Bavaria in southeastern Germany. The glorious gray country of Bavaria that looks like a claw coming around Augsburg and getting stopped by Austrian Bohemia. Whatever. Alright, well I'm gonna move my guys up here, cause... Uh, let's see if it says it there. Ah yes, Grangkorn, Franken. So, what we have to do is we have to take over Franken, and Franken is owned by the Palatinate, and they are not currently allied with anybody because no one has alliances with anybody at the very beginning of the game, so I'm going to declare war on them. And, uh, since I don't have any allies, I'm just not going to do that, so... The way war works in this is that you have to have a causes belay without getting attacked. Like, for example, if I say, declare war with no causes belay, so if I didn't have this mission, I wouldn't have this, the conquest causes belay, then, if I attacked them, I would automatically be at war with Bohemia if they decide to uphold the Holy Roman Empire. So, I am not going to go to war with the 
them with a cause with no cause to lie because that would be stupid. If I do the conquest, that means I get a core on. Well, actually, no, it doesn't. The mission gives me a core, but anyway, um, conquest basically allows for me to take Franken or full annexation of the Palatinate with uh, less infamy, full prestige, and full cost. So, like that, and uh, here we go. When when I declare war, I decrease my stability if I have relations with them in some particular way. Like, I think I had about a hundred relations with them because they're basically... I think I think King Rupert is actually the cousin of Ernst, who's the king of my country. Because he's of the same family and all that, so... Oh! Oh my god! That is beautiful! A level six recruiter. Oh, Jesus. The, uh... The, the Master Recruiter is actually probably one of the best advi- Oh, it's actually level 5, but either way. Uh, the Master Recruiter is one of the best advisors you can possibly get in the game, because what he does is that he increases how fast the manpower develops. So getting one of those bastards is probably the best thing you can possibly do. Because that means you can keep fighting and keep fighting and keep fighting all fucking eternity. So if you're going to war with somebody and you've got a shitload of men, you're basically going to win no matter what. Unless your technology is utterly terrible and you have no fucking generals or anything, so... Yeah. But anyway, that's a very small part of this game. Um... Yeah, there's not really any, any useful advisors here. I think I'll... Commission a tapestry. Yeah, there's, there's various, uh cultural decisions that you can make by accessing this tab from the shield. Like, there's the last jousting tournament, commission pain, endorse culture. Basically, by using your magistrates and sometimes your